نعم اللي تقابل من عمل شيء جدا نعم أنا عارف فان Well, one of the, if you're an opera fan, uh, you know that before the opera proper begins, there's an overture. And then in that overture, the various musical themes that will be heard throughout the entire opera are all blended together in a masterful way so that uh, you recognize those themes when they come up and it helps to tie the whole story together. And what President Drew did uh, just a, a little bit ago was give us a masterful overture of all the various themes that Machen brings out in this book. And uh, honestly, he didn't leave me a whole lot to say. So <laughs> I'm sorry to say this to be short, but you know that's not true, so there's no point to even saying that. But uh, you know, he did a wonderful job, and we will be developing then those themes that you just heard uh, in a little bit more detail. So my assignment is chapter 3, God and Man, and then also chapter 7 uh, that has to do with the church. And we'll talk about tying all, all of those in together. Again, I trust you will hear some of the same themes that... Uh, well, let's dig right in to chapter 3 on God and man. But before we do that, I'd like to turn your attention to a very familiar passage of Scripture, and that would be Psalms, the book of the Psalms, it would be Psalm 1. As we read this, as I read this, I'd like you to think about that overture that you just heard. And think about how this, uh, this psalm reveals some of those things. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of Yahweh, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For Yahweh knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. As Pastor Leary was going through his introductory comments, thinking about the contrast between those that are faithful to God in his revelation and those who are not. And though I think we could recognize that in both camps, the stated goal that we hear is that we will improve society, we will improve people, we will improve relationships. We will improve patience. We will improve services. We will improve. But one is true and one is a lie. One will bring flourishing and one will bring perish. And which this psalm brings out so wonderfully. Major put forth in his book that the Christian gospel consists in an account of how God saved man. But before we can understand that gospel, Machen rightly insists, well, similar in vain to uh, what John Calvin said uh, regarding uh, the scripture saying what, why God gave him to us so that we might know God and what duty he requires of man. We need to understand something about the two, about God and about man, before we can really understand the gospel. We're going to, we'll start, as Machen did, with the doctrine of God. And modern liberalism is diametrically opposed to Christianity with regard to the doctrine of God. You know, one of the things that you will hear in my lecture, and I'm sure some of the others as well, is that it's not just that 
liberalism is calling Christianity into question, trying to sort out the answers in some sort of honest way. No, it is opposed. We are at war, theologically, and we have been for a long time. And the things that maybe to say about this sound as if they could have been written yesterday. Because the battle uh, is still raging, and we must be engaged. As Pastor Liberal pointed out, the, the, the religion of liberalism believes that we should not really seek to know God. That's really not our purview. That's not what we need to be doing. In fact, I would, I would suggest to you that they would actually believe that you can't really know God. You can maybe know about Him to some degree, but only to the extent that you feel His presence. Nathan rightly points out that feeling his presence is at the heart of liberalism. I mean, that really sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, there are many evangelicals that, that love to talk about feeling God's presence. I was, I was, I just felt God's presence. Recent days we've had a, 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 a rash of revivals, so called. And when you read those that were there, they will say things like, I just don't know pregnancy. And if you dare suggest that there might be some question about the proceedings, how could you possibly ever doubt? Because I felt God present. If you bring God's word into the question, well, you're just trying to deny God's presence. You can't deny my experience. For that, that is the sum total of the liberal faith. But Machen points out that any religion that consists merely in feeling the presence of God is devoid of any moral quality whatsoever. Pure feeling is non-moral, he says. There's no fixed standard to this. You can't say it's right or wrong. It's just all about your, the experience of the moment. But by contrast, Christianity affirms that the knowledge of God is the very basis of religion. Mason said rational theism, the knowledge of one supreme person, maker, and active ruler of the world, is at the very root of Christianity. And he's absolutely right. I'm going to be referring uh, this evening to a fine publication called The Fig Tree, which I think is ironic. Uh, since Jesus cursed the fig tree because it wasn't bearing any fruit. Um, I, is this published over on this side of the mountain? We get this over in Spokane. It must be pretty local over there. Uh, oh, this is just the latest edition. I usually throw these away when they come to the mail of all the churches. And um, here we have Synod Companion Practice Ubuntu. We'll call refer to that one a little later. Uh, talk about Gonzaga having a rabbi in the Torah there. Um, a few other things going on. I'll, I'll refer to that one a little bit later. Hey, there's an article back here. Where is it now? Oh, yeah, here it is. So uh, here's an article, always asking why let a young man to study and teach philosophy. This uh, gentleman's name is Keith Wyma, he's a professor of philosophy at Whitworth University, and as it says here, he's built his life on asking the why questions. He, he believes it's important for everyone to learn a bit of philosophy, and he goes on to talk about why. But I want you to listen to what he says. He suggests that once we, quote, reach this level, the level of seeing below the surface and at the core of why people think the way they think, we begin to realize that issues are so complex that we're not going to be able to completely understand them. 
He said, if we realize that about our own, realize that about our own beliefs and realize that about where other people are coming from too, I think it promotes a degree of humility and compassion. Unquote. For him, this is especially evident through the philosophy of religion, which he said has taught him that it is rational to that has taught him that it is rational to believe in God and be a Christian. On the other hand, he said philosophy of religion has also taught him that he's not going to be able to convince everyone to be a Christian by offering demonstrative proof. Although Keith doesn't believe one can achieve a complete proof of the Christian faith, he also doesn't think that is or should be a goal for Christians. We have seen many people who are not Christians talk about how even believing in God is irrational. That's exactly the sort of thing that Machen was arguing against a hundred years ago. This idea that you can be a Christian, but you don't really have to. Yeah, it, it, you can be rational about it, but you don't have to be. You don't really have to know anything. You just have to believe it. You have to feel it. Ultimately, as uh, then, then what the little is left with is, I just find it incredibly uh, inconsistent that you you don't want to believe in anything really. You don't want to be held down by anything really. But so therefore, we're going to go and say that man becomes acquainted with God only through Jesus. The question is, which Jesus are we talking about? Um, a few years ago, uh, we had an active ministerial association in Bonners Ferry. I, I'm a little sad to say that um, through my efforts and a few others, we successfully killed it. Um, it really wasn't our intention, but that's, that's what happened. And the reason it happened is that it was supposed to be a fellowship of pastors in the area. Not a church, but a pastor. And I got involved with it. We had, we had liberals in there, we had Catholics in there, we had Eastern Orthodox in there. We had, uh, it was a hodgepodge. So, it, people were kind of trying to figure out, it was all built around social activities and in terms of you know ministering in the community and doing things like that. And so, we, uh, some of us were getting a little weary of just getting together and shooting the breeze about the next handout we were going to do. And what is really the basis of our fellowship? So me being the Presbyterian that I am, said, well, we need some bylaws. <laughs> yeah, so we put some together, and, and many were... Were, were positive about it. Some were okay with it. Some had strong misgivings. And I'll uh, leave it for you to decide which ones had the strong misgivings. Anyway, in there we put in a doctrinal statement. It's been several years ago, but I can still remember it vividly. You ready? This is the doctrinal statement that we put in. That in order to be a member of the Ministerial Association, you needed to be able to affirm the Apostles' Creed and the absolute authority of Scripture. Period. It did. It emptied. I, the liberals said they were horrified. We don't want to like doctrine. We, that's too doctrinal. We don't want that. We just want to have this relationship. The pastor of the, the, the uh, Lutheran church in town that, you know, we just want to, I mean, seriously, I'm, I'm not making this up. We don't like the Old Testament, it's too bloody. And Paul, he, no, with all we want is the Gospels. Because we just want to believe in Jesus. And my question for him was, which Jesus is that? Because the Jesus of the Gospels preached the Old Testament. And the Apostle Paul 
and those that, that uh, came after Christ. Their preaching was based upon the Jesus that they say they want, and yet they don't want anything else but love and kumbaya around this imaginary Jesus that they have concocted in their minds. This would arise out of what uh, Machen pointed out was the liberal notion that Jesus, quote, had a practical, not a theoretical knowledge of God. And he just sort of, he, he wasn't worried about really knowing God, but just wanted to experience the power of God throughout his ministry. Jesus, in other words, was not bound to an objective reality in the liberal mind. The Christianity believes, as Machen pointed out, that man may know God in other ways than through Jesus alone, which is kind of a startling thought. But then he explains himself, pointing out that even Jesus, as, as he walked in relationship with his Father, he pointed out and saw God's hand in nature. He pointed out that God was to be found in the moral law, that God's law would be written by the Holy Spirit on the hearts of men, and that God is revealed in the Scripture. And then he made this interesting observation. That unless there is some idea of God that is independent of Jesus, ascribing deity to Jesus has no meaning. Let me say that again. Unless there is an idea of God that is independent, set apart from Jesus, Ascribing deity to Christ doesn't have any meaning. And the reason for that is that there has to be an antecedent. So for us, for Christianity, our beliefs, our concepts of things, don't just spring out of thin air or out of our experience. They don't just spring up because we're so impressed with Jesus that, oh, maybe God's like that. Prior revelation gave us the template by which we recognize that Jesus is God. And that is a huge difference between the religion of the liberal and the Orthodox Christian faith. That dependence upon the revelation that God has given of himself. As the very root of Christianity makes a point out, is the belief in the real existence of a personal God to whom we are accountable and with whom we fellowship. And Pastor Lira pointed out the, uh, the the liberal tendency to talk about God as Father and the universal uh, brotherhood of man. It's it's it's, it's ironic that uh, uh, and maybe he points out the irony in, in his day as well that though people don't the liberal mindset doesn't want to really see God as a personal God that you can actually know and really have fellowship with. They love to use the term Father, which is Nothing is not personal and intimate and relational. I mean, it's a useful label, isn't it? Seems to allow for belonging, but without submission. It seems to allow for a broad application of connection without the responsibilities of actual relationship. It has the appearance of genuine Christianity due to the way that the Lord Jesus really, as Machen put it, enriched the meaning of that phrase. And he did. But Jesus used that term uh, regarding that, the Father of God, most specifically uh, concerning those with whom God actually had a relationship, a saving relationship. The liberal concept of fatherhood is polytheistic or pantheistic at its root. Christians, however, deny the teaching of the universal fatherhood of God. Machen says, well, the modern doctrine of the universal fatherhood of God, then, which is being celebrated as the essence of Christianity, really belongs at best only to that vague natural religion which forms the presupposition which the Christian preacher can use when the gospel is to be proclaimed. And when it is regarded as a reassuring, all-sufficient thing, it comes into direct opposition to the New Testament. The gospel itself refers to something entirely different 
The really distinctive New Testament teaching about the fatherhood of God concerns only those who have been brought into the household of faith. Now, a huge issue here uh, concerning the doctrine of God is the whole subject of transcendence. And again, uh, you've heard in the overture earlier about the, uh, the uh, idea uh, that the liberals have they don't like this gulf between us and God. They just love to talk about how one we are. Um, and really, in a metaphysical kind of sense, uh, the modern liberals believe that God is not really a person that's distinct from ourselves, but that our life is part of His. There's a spark of divine in us. We are kind of wound up all together in that, and really God is... Uh, I can almost put it this way, a summation of all of our heart's desires to transcend, for us to transcend, the bounds of the struggles of this life. And so, what uh, I, I think about that and find that, again, strangely inconsistent with the thought that we can only know God through Jesus. Now, it really, that's an excuse. That's painting a pig. Ultimately, liberalism makes man the measure that we're the God and we uh, make him up. Uh, we, are, we are the ones that compose the divine. They break down the distinction between God and the world, between God and humanity. They'll look at the gospel story of the incarnation and as Mason points out, it's sometimes uh, thought of by the liberals as a symbol of the general truth that man at his best is one with God. But essentially, it's just another indication, another example of making gods of their own image. But Christianity holds that God is both transcendent and imminent. The Bible teaches that there is an awful gulf that separates the creature from the creator. But God is not imminent in the world uh, because he identifies with it, but because he is the, the free creator and upholder of it. He's not made up of the world itself, nor is he made up of the sum of its processes. He is something wholly other. But the liberal says no. That famous painting of man and God that you have to touch each other sums up really well the liberal idea that we can reach out and touch them. And of course, that is uh, altogether too much too low of a view of our infant tree. Now, I need to move on. Christianity differs from liberalism not only in its conception of God, but also in the conception of man. Modern liberalism has lost, uh, and this is the other side of the coin at, at this point, has lost all sense of that gulf that separates the creature from the creator. Because liberals have uh, the supreme confidence in human goodness, in, in spite of the evidence to the contrary, they have little to no consciousness of sin or denying that, it's, that it exists altogether. And when that situation is in place, there is no such thing as gospel because there's no need. The reason the gospel is good news is because we are incapable of saving ourselves because of our sin. If we were sinless, nothing to be condemned for, then so what about the gospel? The subsequent result is that Western culture has become primarily pagan. I like Mason's definition of paganism in this book. And I, have, I have good friends that identify themselves and consider themselves to be pagan. And... Um, it gives me ammunition to talk with them about it. But uh, in and of itself, his definition, it, 
it, it's helpful. It basically, it's an idea to find harmony between yourself and your environment using the resources within yourself to accomplish it. Okay, so paganism can look uh, very different in a lot of different contexts. But it can be hidden, as in legalism, the idea that a certain set of practices may you favor with the divine. Paganism can be subtle uh, when it imposes values that are foreign to the scriptures upon moral or ceremonial matters. Everything from worship, gender issues, sacramentalism, family relationships, moral standards in society, social gospel uh, approaches to dealing with the world, and all those sorts of things are impacted when we impose foreign values on the scriptures. It's just a, a whitewash form of paganism. Sometimes it can be blatant, as in the apostasy of the PCUSA reimagining movement. We're speaking of Sophia, those kinds of things that have been done uh, in this recent uh, generations. Uh, seeking false ecumenicity, uh, ecumenical relationships with religions like Islam or you, you pick whatever false stuff you want. The Christianity, by contrast, was always taught from the Bible that man is a sinner under the just condemnation of God. Christianity is, a, is the religion of the broken heart, Mason said. Not that your heart stays broken, but it begins broken, recognizing your brokenness so that you come to be mended. That's the complete odds with liberal paganism. Without the consciousness of sin, the whole of the gospel will seem to be, as Mason puts it, an idol. It, it, it truly is seen by such um, folks as foolish. But how do, we, how do we regain the consciousness of sin? Nathan says that it can be accomplished by proclaiming the law of God. The law reveals our transgression. He convinces us of sins. It is God alone, though, that can produce that change. We can't drum up the goodness within us. Somehow we go, oh, yeah, you know what? I am a sinner. He's the one that has to uh, renew our minds uh, and bring us faith and repentance. The fundamental fault of modern liberal preachers, Nathan says, is they're trying to bring men into the church without convicting them of sin. He points out that even our Lord did not call the righteous to repentance. But sinners. Now, we need to move on. Chapter 7. <clears throat> I, when I first got this assignment, I was like, okay. Chapter 3. Chapter 7. Seemed to be a bit arbitrary. And I'm like, well, how am I going to connect these things? Well, the overture helps. Uh, but I think it was actually how the, the length of the material somehow equally distributed among us. That's how that one's up. But when you even, even so, when you look at it, it's not too hard to see the connection between the doctrines of, of man and God and the doctrine of the church. After all, it is in the church where God and man meet and find the fullest fellowship when his word is upheld and he is sought uh, according to his design. But in chapter 7, uh, regarding the church, Nathan's emphasis is, well, there's some, there's some discussion that impacts uh, the relation of the individual to the church and all of that. But his emphasis is more broadly ecclesiastical rather than a matter of membership. He's dealing with the specter of tyrannical leadership in the visible church, which he was fighting vigorously. And he's urging the leadership of the church especially to stand firm against the inroads of liberal thought, those inroads that were denying to the church its power. Where is the church, and how is the church powerful? When, where do we get that power? It is when we walk in accountability to the transcendent God. And when the liberal thought was 
denying the church's purpose, which is calling fallen mankind to repentance, to faith, to worship. It makes the church, in spite of their desire to make everything relevant, it makes it utterly irrelevant. Is it any wonder that people leave the liberal churches in droves? Why should they go? Beyond it being a social club, what possible good does it do? If, if, if we're the measure of things, why should I have someone stand up here and tell me what to do? Or tell me what's right? If I'm the one who determines it. Well, it's time for us to take a, a firm stand. And Nathan finishes his book in chapter 7 with pointing out that it's time to stand. But that saying has to be based upon knowledge. Upon doctrine. And when that stand is taken, the impact then goes far beyond individual salvation. It truly does reach to all society. That is how, trans how society truly is transformed. So Mason's warning a hundred years ago still stands today. That liberalism and Christianity must no longer be proclaimed from the same organization because they are diametrically opposed. They are fundamentally different. They are incompatible religions. And where we see its inroads in the visible church, we ought to stand firmly against it and drive it out. Major design defines the church as the society of those that have been saved. And he points out that the highest Christian answer to the special needs of man, of the, the social needs of man, is found in the church. He says, quote, if we really love our fellow men, we shall never be content with binding up their wounds or pouring on oil and wine or rendering them any such lesser service. We shall indeed do such things. But the main business of our lives will be to bring them to the Savior of their souls. <laughs> to that end, Machen urges the leaders of the church, the officers of the church, to devote themselves to both the propagation and defense of Christianity. Because, as he points out, the greatest menace to the Christian church today comes not from the enemies outside, but from the enemies within. He goes on to say, one cause of weakness in the church is perfectly plain. The church of today has been unfaithful to her Lord by admitting great companies of non-Christian per uh, persons, not only into her membership, but into her teaching agencies. And so it was the duty of the officers of the church to engage in intellectual and spiritual struggle. He admonishes us at the present time and the opponents of the gospel are almost in control of our churches. The slightest avoidance of the defense of the gospel is just sheer unfaithfulness to the Lord. And he urges that the officers hold candidates to the ministry to a high biblical standard. It is strange, he says, how in the interest of an utterly false kindness to men, Christians are sometimes willing to relinquish their loyalty Come back to the picture. Well, the time the uh, front page article here is about Synod Companions. This is Northwest Intermountain Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church and the Ilonga Kilomero Diocese in Tanzania trying to come together. And um, the, uh, I'm not sure exactly what this lady position is. Um, entitled prior. Oh, she's the chair of the Synod Companion Synod Committee. 
And uh, she points out, they turn this Ubuntu, an understanding that I am because you are. What happens to me affects you. What happens to you affects me. The understanding of compassion, being together, walking together, and living together. And that is the standard that we all walk together in, uh, in peace and harmony, regardless of anything else. And then I turned the page, and I thought, well, that was pretty enlightening. And here's an article, um, Pope and uh, WCC leaders commit to walk together. This is during this of Pope Francis in Rome on March 23rd, a World Council of Churches delegation of the Roman Catholic Church committed to walking, praying, and working together for justice, reconciliation, and unity. Uh, the meeting noted stronger bonds between the WCC and the Roman Catholic Church. They increase ecumenical collaboration. They're all trying to work together to strengthen church unity in a divided world. The Pope calls for an ecumenism of the heart which gives a clear common witness to Christ, even where institutional unity of the churches has not yet been achieved. How, I would ask you, can you have a clear common witness to Christ when you don't agree on who he is? And yet that is the liberal mentality. We don't care about the doctrine, we care about the feeling. That's the foundation of liberal calls for unity. It's at the expense of revealed truth. So, it is incumbent upon us as officers of the church to insist upon ministers who are zealous for the Christ that is revealed in all of Scripture. Towards that end, Christian education must be renewed. This is a huge thing for me. He pointed out that schools are being ruined by the absurd notion that something can be drawn out of the mind before anything is put in. Maybe that's what we want. Education needs to be renewed to counter simple ignorance, renewed to counter state control, renewed to counter a false understanding of what Christianity is. He points out the growth of ignorance in the church is the logical and inevitable result of the false notion that Christianity is only a life and not also a doctrine. If Christianity is not a doctrine, then of course teaching, he says, is not necessary. And then he goes on to point out that education needs to be renewed in every venue possible. Family, educational agencies, the church, and even individual responsibility as well. Christian education, he says, is the chief business of the hour for every earnest Christian man. Christianity cannot subsist unless men know what it is. And the fair and logical thing is to learn what Christianity is, not from its opponents, but from those who themselves are Christians. Yeah. And then finally, he does bring things back and with a little bit more of an individual kind of tone to it. That is, he's speaking about how is society truly to be transformed? How, uh, how are we really to walk in unity? What, what is the foundation of unity? And he speaks of it as being bound together in the fellowship of the Spirit. Here is the genuine basis for unity. With this, he, these are in the closing words of the book. There must be somewhere groups of redeemed men and women who can gather together humbly in the name of Christ to give thanks to him for his unspeakable gift and to worship the Father through him. Such groups alone can satisfy the needs of the soul. One hears much is true about Christian unity, harmony, cooperation. But the union that is meant is often a union with the world against the Lord. Or at best, a forced union of machinery and tyrannical committees. How different is the true unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace? There are congregations, even in the present age of conflict, that are really gathered around the table of the crucified Lord. There are pastors that are pastors indeed. But such congregations in many cities, are hard to find. Is there no refuge from strife? Is there no place of refreshing where a man can prepare for the battle of life? Is there no place where two or three can gather in Jesus' name? If there be such a place, then that is the house of God. And that is the gate of heaven. And from under the threshold of that house will go forth a river that will revive 
the weary world. Major, of course, was writing in the aftermath of the World War. Of love and certainty in those things. And he acknowledges that he goes through these chapters. But he rightly points out that while the near future may seem uncertain, the end is clear. Christ and the church are absolutely triumphant. Our God will not abandon us. He may yet have another reformation in store for us. His truth will stand, and each of us must determine whether or not we will stand with Him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for the insight and courage that You gave 